This is an exciting time to give a brief update about the outpatient management of COVID-19. It's exciting for two reasons. One is that we have a lot of new novel therapeutics available to us, although they're, they'll take a few weeks, maybe months to be fully available. Also, despite being overwhelmed by Omicron right now, infections, this is potentially the end of the pandemic. And I hope that by April, May, be in a much better position in terms of managing our patients with uh, COVID-19. Let's talk about what's new in the last few weeks. But before I talk about novel therapeutics, I want to review some important mistakes that are made with diagnostic testing. Um, what we find is that our patients are confused about how to interpret rapid antigen tests. Remember, they're not perfect. Here we have in the red line from this JAMA figure, the um, when rapid testing are positive. So sometimes that's uh, a few days before infection begins. This is a symptomatic infection right here, the dotted black line, and can last for a few days afterwards, then quickly dissipate. But here's the key. They're not perfectly sensitive, of course, we know that. They don't pick, out, pick up all infections, and here we're missing. If this is maybe 100% of infections, we're missing all of these. So it's very important to counsel our patients. <clears throat> if you have symptoms, if you've had a close contact, a negative antigen test is not adequate to rule out infection and needs to be confirmed by PCR. If you have symptoms, isolate for five days um, would be uh, the best advice. Now, PCR tests, more sensitive, will pick up more infections. So um, if a negative antigen test with a patient with symptoms can be, um, can be followed up with a PCR, that would be ideal. The one thing to remember with PCR tests, don't repeat them in a week or two to see if the patient's still infected. They'll have residual RNA in their nose very commonly, but that doesn't mean they're infectious. Antigen tests are more directly related to infectivity when they're positive. Despite the CDC changing its isolation to in quarantine for five days with, act, with symptomatic infection, I strongly recommend doing a rapid antigen test at the end of those five days to confirm that uh, the antigen is uh, not present. Now, let's dive in <clears throat> to the exciting new developments. What's come out in the last few weeks? First of all, uh, the pills. One of these is uh, uh, I'm very excited about, another I'm, I'm, I'm not. So let's dive into the details about uh, our two new pills that are newly available to treat uh, COVID-19 in the ambulatory setting. The first one I'd like to talk about, the one I'm excited about, is Nirmatrelvir plus Ritonavir. This is a combination, Paxlovid, that is um, uh, now available. Supply is extremely limited for now, but we'll get at the end how to best uh, use our limited supplies. The key here is that we haven't actually seen the study yet, but the FDA has. And what they've seen it, uh, looks promising. There's been over 2,000 patients randomized uh, to either uh, the combination uh, protease inhibitor pills or placebo, dramatic decrease in hospitalizations and deaths from 6.5% to 0.7% over the first month of uh, treatment. Now, a few keys here. These are protease inhibitors, so medications that have been widely used in this type of medication, the class of medication, widely used to treat HIV and other viruses in the past. We have a lot of experience with them. So safety should be relatively well understood. Drug-drug uh, interactions being one of the most important ones because this combination of protease inhibitors is a potent CYP3A uh, inhibitor. So that needs to be carefully reviewed with patients before prescribing. And a caveat, if a patient has untreated HIV or HIV disease, review the case uh, and care and plan with infectious disease expert prior to prescribing uh, these pills. Now, the most important thing, they need to be prescribed early. The study uh, involves only patients who received it within five days of symptom symptomatic infection. I'd recommend not extending that as we're trying to stop viral rep replication before the immune system uh, kicks in or really over kicks in. So I would really like this to be provided to patients within three, four, five days 
of symptomatic infection whenever possible. Now, the pill I'm a lot less excited about is molnupiravir. The, the problem, we have seen the study. There's a large study, 1,400 people, and it's published in the New England Journal. The, um, the benefits were uh, not as dramatic and often not crossing uh, uh, the line of being statistically significant. Uh, here we see that the overall hospitalization or death at uh, one month was 9.7% compared to 6.8% with the um, pill. A more uh, caution here in terms of the class. It's a class of uh, drugs that's never been used in humans before. We have a lot, we understand a lot less. Hopefully it'll be safe, but in Jack's errors into the viral RNA. Does it cause any damage uh, in human cells? Yet to be entirely worked out. For now, I would avoid in younger people who are of reproductive age, um, that it's not indicated for anyone under 18, pregnant women or lactate women. This is, I'm not crazy about this as it has the least potential benefit and uh, potential unknown, unknown risks. But it's going to be, at least for the short term, more available than the combination protease inhibitor that we just talked about. I put this in here to remind us from data from last year. Let's not treat our outpatients with dexamethasone or other oral corticosteroids. The data is pretty clear from the recovery trial published last year that if you gave dexamethasone too early in the disease process, so in the case here, it was hospitalized patients who did not require oxygen, then they actually fared worse or, or had a trend toward faring worse. So reminder, do not give dexamethasone to outpatient setting. And this is also a reminder not to use antibiotics unnecessarily. We're not seeing a lot of cases. It's unusual to see a bacterial superinfection pneumonia over uh, COVID-19 pneumonia. So COVID-19 pneumonias do not require antibiotics, azithromycin or any other. Now, we also have some infusions uh, that are available. There's been a big dramatic change in terms of um, Omicron in respect to monoclonals. Now in the United States, there's only one available monoclonal that is effective against um, uh, Omicron or thought to be the Omicron variant. Let's take a look at it. So sotorvimab was designed not just uh, based on antibody response to SARS-CoV-2, the etiological agent of COVID-19, but also to SARS-CoV-1, uh, the uh, cause of SARS, the original SARS outbreak, um, and other similar viruses in that family. Therefore, we expect it to be uh, able to treat other variants, not just um, the original um, SARS-CoV-2. So what does this mean? This means that we can still keep using it, but supplies are extremely limited at present. It's, uh, it has dramatic benefit, a small but well-conducted study also published in the New England Journal of uh, roughly 600 patients found that hospitalizations or death within the first month dropped from 7% to 1%. Excellent uh, outcome, small study. We would love it to be uh, replicated, but for now, this is a great option if it's available. Requires IV infusion, particularly difficult these days, given the problem that we have just delivering healthcare with Omicron racing through all of our um, clinics, offices, hospitals. But if it's possible, if you have it available, I would provide it to patients. Just remember, it needs to be given early, just like the pill, within five days. The study included only patients that were symptomatic for five days or less. So that's incredibly uh, important. Now, let's turn to convalescent plasma. So this is the plasma of someone who's recovered from COVID-19. Um, you might recall that there's many studies showing that it's not beneficial in hospitalized patients and even a carefully done study in outpatients, all true. However, high titer, i.e. selecting plasma that has very high titers of antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 is actually effective. One small study out of uh, Chile published last year, as well as a preprint that just appeared uh, last few days in the United States, strongly suggests that high titer convalescent plasma will be helpful. Again, should be given early, ideally as early as possible, but within eight days as the US study uh, performed. The uh, Chilean study was within 
72 hours, three days. So as early as possible, provide high, tighter convalescent plasma. But check with your the blood bank, with your pathologist, and make sure that you can arrange for high, tighter um, plasma. If uh, that's not available, it's not worth giving a uh, regular uh, convalescent plasma. Uh, a reminder, if you're gonna use monoclonals or high titer convalescent plasma, should not be given to inpatients with COVID-19, should not be given to patients requiring oxygen for COVID-19 or who are on oxygen who are now requiring a higher dose. Those patients are likely in the second uh, more serious stage of illness. These are treatments to try to decrease viral replication um, and they're not thought to be uh, effective in the later stages. Um, now, there's another new exciting development, which is even harder to deliver, but uh, might give us some options, especially in an uh, institutionalized setting if we have a, a COVID-19 outbreak. Remdesivir. Remdesivir, um, as we know, is sometimes used in the inpatient setting, has some studies have shown benefit, others not, uh, but it seems to have a, a modest beneficial effect. It now appears the same uh, case in the outpatient setting, you need to start this uh, within the, the first seven days, but this could probably be used a little later, days four, five, six, seven. Um, in the trial, uh, roughly 600 patients, and the death or hospitalization rate dropped dramatically again, 5% of the placebo down to 0.7% in the remdesivir group. Problem, you have to infuse remdesivir on, intravenously three consecutive days. That's why I mentioned in uh, institutional setting, this is probably, uh, uh, might be practical if you had supplies, but in a normal ambulatory setting, uh, like most of us uh, practicing, probably uh, unlikely. It can have some cardiovascular effects, so it needs to monitor patients for bradycardia and uh, hypotension, as well as allergic reactions. Now, for the foreseeable future, we're gonna have dramatic shortages of these. So who, should get them, who should be offered them. And the NIH has created a very thoughtful uh, tier system, which they just published a few days ago. And this tier system helps us make those decisions. If you only have enough uh, treatment for tier one, that's who gets it. And then you expand to tier two when you have supplies and et cetera, et cetera. Now, the key here, and I won't go into all the details, you can read them, but basically tier one, the most important people that should get any of these treatments are very high risk individuals for progression of hospitalization or death due to COVID-19. That's either um, people with risk factors who are unvaccinated or people with severe immunological deficiency in which we do not expect that the vaccine would be effective. Those are the patient and with severe risk factors for progression. Those are the patients tier one who should get the limited supplies today. Now, let's uh, just review a few key points. Positive antigen tests in the setting of symptoms and plus minus known uh, COVID contact should be presumed COVID positive, needs to verify with PCR or just isolate for five days. Um, treatments, now for those highest risk patients, the key is getting all of these treatments, maybe with the exception of remdesivir, in as early as possible. Second key, they're tiered. They're not all equal. This is just my personal opinion, but this is how I would, um, I, I would uh, prioritize them if I had them all available in the following order. And I would only give one. The, uh, my first choice would be the combination protease inhib inhibitor marketed as Paxlovid. This is because the data seems strongest and it's a well-known drug class that we have a lot of experience with. Next would be an infusion. I would either give the one monoclonal antibody that's still effective against Omicron variant, Sotrovimab, or I would give high, high titer convalescent plasma. If one and two are not available, I would go to remdesivir um, for my patients. Lastly, and only if patients are older, would I um, consider giving molnupiravir. Uh, I'm concerned not just that the data is not super strong, but also about potential adverse effects. If you want to learn more, please uh, check out my 
uh, up-to-date chapter on the outpatient management of COVID-19 and several videos that uh, we have posted. While this is a trying time with, the, with being overwhelmed by Omicron, I have a strong sense that we're going to be in a much better position come April, May of this year. As this passes by, these interventions are widely available and, fortunately, and hopefully will be out of this uh, pandemic. 